Plug-in hybrids. They are the proper stepping stone between a hybrid or a gasoline car and a full-on electric car. And with many folks wondering about electric cars and are not ready to make the pledge, plug-in hybrids are actually a great option for those who are on the fence. They want an electric car, but they don't want a full electric car because of the range of anxiety, because of various reasons. In today's video, I'm going to share with you one model that kind of flies under the radar a little bit. It is not perfect, but it is, in my opinion. We've reviewed now a lot of plug-in hybrids. This is one of the best on the market with one thing that kind of puts it down. And that model is the Toyota RAV4 Prime plug-in hybrid. In today's video, I'm going to share with you why this is a car that actually flies under the radar of some and why if you're nervous about electric cars, you should actually give this car a chance. We're gonna talk about some technical stuff. We're gonna look at the inside and the outside. And we're gonna share with you some things you should know about this. And more importantly, some things that are not good about this particular car, which I wish they would fix. Let's get started. We'll talk about it some more. Let's start with the most important question. Well, we're talking about this car that is a plug-in hybrid. What is a plug-in hybrid? Let's just define that in a simple fashion here. So if you are curious, you will know exactly what that means. So we're all familiar with hybrids, you know, gasoline engine, electric motor, they work together. We get a very efficient powertrain. Plug-in hybrids are actually hybrids that are modified to be the plug-in part. So basically this, RAV4 Prime is exactly the same, with some tweaks, of course, but exactly the same otherwise, to a RAV4 hybrid, just a regular RAV4 hybrid, except this has a much larger battery, the high voltage battery, it has a much larger one, which enables you to charge this battery up and drive it in electric mode only. And once that electric range depletes, you can actually drive it as a regular hybrid, Here's the engine, there's an ECVT here, and it drives exactly the same as a regular hybrid. That's the special part. And some of you will, will say, wait a second, so what is exactly the purpose of this? And that's a very good question. See, this particular RAV4 Prime gets right around 40 miles of charge, so you can drive it in electric mode for 40 miles. That, some will start laughing usually tesla drivers will start laughing at that number and that's okay but plug-in hybrid drivers will start laughing when there is a line at the charging station and it's really cold outside and all the cars are disabled on the side because after you are done with your small but decent actually 40 miles of range your engine will come on and this will become a hybrid and just like any other hybrid, we go anywhere. This is who is going to end up buying a plug-in hybrid for the right reasons. You have a daily commute of say 10 to 15 miles one way. You're gonna charge this car up overnight. Doesn't charge fast, not an electric car. You don't need to go to a station. You can put a level two charger, but you can even charge a regular at a 110 outlet overnight should give you pretty close to the full. You do your daily commute, which you're gonna do every single day to work and back. You get back from work, maybe you'll take your family to grocery shopping, whatnot. Well, you've depleted your 40 miles, you plug it in overnight, you wake up in the morning and you do that over and over and over again. Then once or twice a year, you wanna take your family on a very long road trip. You basically just start the car and go. You don't have to plan your trip according to the where we're gonna plug in this electric car. You don't have to worry about anything because this is basically turns into a hybrid. You put gas, we keep going, it's very efficient, and life is great. This is the mentality of the plug-in hybrid buyer because otherwise, if you're gonna buy this and not charge it, not utilize that EV range, save your money, buy a hybrid because they're exactly the same. That's the bottom line. Let's talk about the RAV4 Prime itself, because in my opinion, I, we have tested a lot of plug-in hybrids now, we have researched this a lot, and I keep coming back to this one. This one is possibly one of the best plug-in hybrids currently available for sale in 2024, and here's why. First, 
Toyota actually pioneered the hybrid system. They were the ones that stuck it out from the beginning and didn't give up. Many other companies gave up and now they're back to it. But Toyota never gave up. They actually got their system to be efficient, reliable, and well-made and long-lasting. And these are the things that make average Joe buying a car today very happy. This is not an exciting car, although it's a little bit more exciting than the usual RAV4. It is not a thrilling car. It is not a car meant to move your emotions. No. This is as kitchen appliance as they come. But you know what? Everybody needs a kitchen appliance. Not everybody needs that high-end fridge that, does, that is fragile and is scary. Everybody needs a kitchen appliance. And this one is a very good one. And here is why. This is basically nothing new. That's the best part. Toyota took their regular hybrid system from a current RAV4 hybrid and they modified it to make it into a plug-in hybrid. This engine, for example, in the RAV4 Prime is an A25A, an engine that has been around since 2018 where there has been many examples with a lot of miles on them, well over 200,000 miles. There hasn't been really any disaster patterns. That's what I call them in the mechanics world. We don't have repeated problem after problem after problem. And trust me, I have been doing this for a long time. I will share with you a small piece of information. Problems with engines, they start from the beginning. You start seeing these problem patterns from the beginning and they only get worse with time. This engine though, there has been a couple little things the first year that it came out. Things have been quiet. You take care of this engine, it's gonna take care of you, and that is really good. There's been a few quirks here and there, which we're gonna talk about in a bit, but not much else. And then the transmission in this, P810. This transmission is actually not exclusive to the RAV4 Prime, and that's the best part. This is the same transmission from a Sienna hybrid. This is the same transmission from a Highlander hybrid. They do not have any exclusive stuff. Some stuff, yes, they are exclusive to the RAV4 Prime, but the big, big ticket items, they're not. And that is the cool thing here. The inverter, for example, it's a very similar inverter to the regular hybrid. Yes, it is modified for the plug-in part, but it's very similar in operation. It doesn't add a lot more to make it a plug-in hybrid. But the best part about this is, if you research Toyota and electric cars, Toyota currently have one electric car. It is abysmal. Sorry, Toyota, but the truth has to be said. And the reason for that is not because they can't make a good electric car. They don't believe in electric cars to their own saying. Don't take my word for it. They're not fully convinced that current electric cars and their current technology and current shape is the way to go. And secretly, this is just my humble opinion from just reading the narrative here. This is where they think the future is. And they did this very, very well. There's a few things about the RAV4 Prime that make it special, and I'd like to share them with you because every other plug-in hybrid I drive, they always miss the point. The biggest thing about the RAV4 Prime is it is a normal car. It does not feel like there is too much going on in the background. You get in the car, you start it, it has a normal key, it has a normal switch gear inside. It looks normal. Yes, it's slightly different, but like the packaging or whatnot. But the car itself feels like a normal RAV4. If you own a RAV4, regular RAV4, even a non-hybrid, you get into this, oh, it's just like my car. Let's keep driving. And that is the first important thing that they did here. They did not overcomplicate this into some hyper spaceship just because it's the prime. No, they actually didn't do that. And the second thing is, they put a powertrain that is shared with other models. The engine, the transmission, most of the inverter, they're the same stuff. And that is a typical recipe of Toyota. They tried initially, I feel like, to market it as this fun, it is the fastest RAV4 ever. It goes from zero to 60, something like 5.4 seconds. I am sorry to say this, Toyota. Nobody cares. Not a single RAV4 Prime owner cares. You buy this because it is functional and it is a good plug-in hybrid. And the most important thing is it's reliable. There has been 
now two three cars that have come in the shop one particular one that i remember it is now approaching 160 165,000 miles there has been another one that had over 200,000 miles on the same transmission they run perfectly fine just like this particular one with 7,000 miles that's why you buy the RAV4 Prime because not only are they good as a plug-in hybrid they're reliable because they did not go overboard. But let's talk about some things that are actually different between the RAV4 Prime and the regular RAV4 Hybrid because those things add one or two things that you should know about them. Here is the differences between a RAV4 Prime and a RAV4 Hybrid. So they basically took a RAV4 Hybrid and they slowly solved problems as they came getting to the plug-in hybrid state. So the first problem is, which is where I think kind of the party piece of the RAV4 Prime is, the HVAC system. See, most plug-in hybrids, they'll even later Lexuses, uh, we're starting to see that on the Lexus side, they take the easy route out. How do you heat the cabin when it's cold and you're in EV mode? That's the biggest question mark. So the way most manufacturers do it is they use a coolant heater. That heater will come on, it will heat up the coolant, that coolant goes in the heater core and you have heat inside the car. Some of them have used PTC heaters inside, they, they've, but they've always been around that realm. While Toyota or the RAV4 Prime, they did not go that route because that would be the easy, inefficient route because that electric heater needs to come on and it uses so much electricity and it just kind of becomes counterproductive. Here they went the extremely complicated route but the good one, efficiency-wise, and so far there has, hasn't really been issues. They went with a heat pump system. If you look at this giant contraption of hoses and lines and all kinds of components, it looks so scary just to look at it. It's like, this is going to be my kid's college fund goes into fixing this. Actually, it's not the case because there hasn't been much that has gone wrong with this. The way the heat pump system works to make, to make this not super complicated and long, they took the regular AC system where the cold side is inside and the hot side is out, and they, f they, have, they gave the system the ability to flip that where the hot side is in, cold side is out, and now you have heat. It's a very brilliant system. Actually, heat pump system is nothing new or exclusive. It's actually used in homes as well. It's a very efficient system, up to a certain temperature though. And this is where you gotta know about this. Up to negative 14 degrees Fahrenheit, the system works great. It's very efficient, very quiet, just kind of works in the background and you don't even feel it. Up to when you get to negative 14, the engine gets forced on, because the engine is the biggest heat generator, because there's combustion. Engine gets forced on, it kicks you out of EV mode, and now the engine is running because you have to run the engine to maintain heat in the cabin. That's the only downside of the heat pump system. So one of the questions you want to ask yourself if you're buying this car is, are you going to be operating this in negative 14 degrees Fahrenheit pretty regularly? If that's the case, this may start to come out of your shopping list because the system will simply become ineffective at that point. And then the other difference is, the battery. See, in the RAV4 Hybrid, you have a very tiny battery, so it's right underneath the back seat, pretty simple and standard. In this, you have a massive lithium-ion battery that sits actually on the outside of the car, underneath it, it's very heavily protected, and it is not air-cooled, it actually uses refrigerant from the HVAC system to cool that battery and an electric heater to heat it up because lithium-ion batteries are very tricky. You can't get them too cold or you can't get them too hot. They have to operate in an optimal operating condition. And one thing about the batteries, and some folks will be concerned, wait a second, that battery is extremely expensive and sounds like what's going to total this car. You would be right. But here's something about Toyota. They are so conservative about their battery management. That's why their BZ4X experiment was not very good because they're way too conservative. They kind of went at that electric car like they did here, except here it works because that battery is going to last a long time. And the BZ4X, you don't have an engine. 
That's why things didn't work out very well. The battery management here works hyperactive is the word I'm going to use. First, many plug-in hybrids, you can actually fast charge them. Not to the same level as electric cars, but you can still fast charge them. Well, they don't allow you to do that here. Most plug-in hybrids out there, they allow you to charge directly to the battery without using the onboard charger. This, you cannot do that. You are limited by the onboard charger because you're supplying power to this onboard charger and it will charge the battery as it deems necessary to make sure that this battery will last a long time. That's why one of the, we're going to talk about this a little bit, the downsides of this car is the charge time for a plug-in hybrid. They're actually pretty long. But just know, if you're going to operate this car at the proper way it was intended and not try to drive it like an electric car, you're going to realize that that charge time is not long at all. You're going to plug it in overnight. If you really need faster charge times, go to level two. There we go. You can charge it much faster and we're good. The only other thing that is different is, of course, we just talked about the onboard charger. This has an onboard charger. This does have its own dedicated cooling system that is air-cooled, does have a filter, that is for the onboard charger, which now sits underneath the back seat. Otherwise, this is not really that much different than a hybrid, the regular RAV4 hybrid. Same maintenance, two cooling systems, one for the engine, one for the inverter. The transmission is an ECVT P810, takes WS fluid, drain and fill, every 60,000 miles, and that's about it. Rear differential, it's an MGR from any other unit, drain and fill every 60,000 miles, and we are good to go. The only additional maintenance that got added for the RAV4 Prime is you need to service the HVAC system, like the refrigerant and the AC every 80,000 miles. And the reason for that is they want to make sure that your system is not low or slightly low where it's working but not working at 100% capacity. The only reason for that is this cools the battery and they do not want your AC system to be overloaded and not working properly and not be able to cool that battery properly. That's the only reason they added that. Otherwise, I mean, it's just... Uh, it's a C system that is able to reverse operations. Very complicated. If you want to know actually how complicated it is, I did make a video explaining exactly how the system works. I'll leave that right here. But that's the only additional maintenance on the RAV4 Prime. So let's talk about other maintenance things. The negative maintenance, I'll call it. There's no alternator. There's no starter. There's no drive belt. There is a very high likelihood that you will not replace your brakes until well over 100,000 miles because this uses heavy regenerative braking and the brakes, the hydraulic brakes, don't get used as much. So that's some of those benefits. And something else you should know about the RAV4 Prime. Remember that this is a gasoline engine. You got to keep that in mind. See, here's what I see people will do. They will buy this and they will never want the engine to come on. And I already see this. I read it on Reddit. I read it everywhere. People will have competitions. How long can we go on this tank of fuel? That is not a good idea. Now, the RAV4 Prime does have a mode that is programmed into it. Every, don't quote me this exact number, but every six months, it will force the engine to come on for an entire drive cycle to avoid fuel getting stale. Now, most people will say, well, that's efficient, that's sufficient, we don't need any more. That's actually not good. You're basically going to get this fuel in the car every six months, you're going to use it once, and then it's going to keep going. That is flying too close to the sun. You're going to end up with a lot of problems because of that. Don't do that. This is not an electric car. You want that engine to run here and there. Don't overdo it. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. Basically, let's talk about the scenario we talked about. You have a 15-mile commute. You're going to charge the car overnight. You're going to drive to work and back, go to the grocery store, take your kid to, to piano practice, whatever the case may be. Then you're back and you never use the engine. One day out of the week, we're not going to charge this car and let it sit. We're going to use the engine because even at that point, 
you are still way ahead of having just a regular RAV4 hybrid because the rest of the week, you actually use electric only. One day of the week, we're going to use it as a hybrid, not going to charge it, let the gas run through. That way, if you're going to fill up every two, three months of you daily using it, that's still very good. And you're recycling, you're reusing that gas. Now, some folks have mentioned, why don't we use stable or something that stabilizes the fuel? Why don't we not? Why don't we just drive it once a week in, in hybrid mode and not have to worry about that? Because average Joe will forget, and then we have all kinds of problems. That's the important thing. And the second important thing, equally to the gasoline, the maintenance of the engine. See, regardless of how you're driving this car, you still have to follow the maintenance of the engine. Not say, well, this engine is not coming on. I'm not going to have to do that oil change. Don't do that, folks. Because if this engine comes on once in the six months that you're trying not to get it to run, come on, that is enough to get enough fuel into that crankcase. Every, by the way, gasoline engines, when you turn them on, you'll have some fuel in the oil. That is normal. Not at an alarming rate where it's fuel delusion, but you will have some fuel that make its way on a cold engine when it starts. Leave that fuel sitting there. And one warning about this engine, this engine has a tendency of building up moisture because it's very sealed. That moisture, just sitting there, sitting there, never gets warmed up, never gets cycled, never gets changed. Eventually, we start all kinds of problems. So with these engines, even if you don't use them, which you shouldn't, but in case you do that, keep your maintenance. 5,000 mile oil changes, six months. Do a maintenance, because remember, you bought this car for its reliability, not to be a Tesla-like. If you want to have an electric car, don't buy the BZ4X, it's a terrible car. Go buy an electric car. This is not it. You still have to maintain this engine, and you still have to let it run periodically so you wouldn't have issues and kind of negate the whole point of buying this reliable car. Nothing is perfect in life, including the RAV4 Prime. It's an imperfect machine made by imperfect humans. So there's got to be something that's not good about it. And there's actually quite a few stuff. Let's start so you can really get the full picture here. The first problem is there is only two trims in the RAV4 Prime for reasons I do not understand. There is the SE and there is the XSE. Let us iterate one thing that we already said. This is a very good kitchen appliance. It is not an exciting car. It is not a car that makes you smile. It is an efficient everyday car that the masses will drive. And it's a very good one for that. But I don't understand the insistence of this being a sports model. This is the furthest thing from a sports model. We only have two sport models. We have the SE, and we have the XSE. And the problem with that, that that brings is, we have the prices. This RAV4, which is basically for other, all intents and purposes, a standard RAV4, starts in 2024 at around $43,000, plus destination, plus everything else. And then if you top it out, like similar to this one, the XSC model, the premium package, $52,000 for a RAV4. That's the problem. At that price point, any sensible person will take one good look at this and be like, yeah, I'm going to buy a Highlander hybrid, or I'm going to buy a Grand Highlander, which is an excellent three-row SUV. Why would I buy this? I don't need all these options that are to in, in the average car buyer's mentality is buying kitchen appliance. All these gadgets that are going to break. That's all the words I hear all the time. And even though with Toyota, most of these gadgets have proven reliable, but still, the more stuff you have in a car, the more likely things will go south 10, 15 years later. So... It is a great mystery to me why we don't have a base model. Because if we did have a base model that brought this car under the $40,000 range, 37, 36, 
Now it's more in tune with the regular prices of RAV4. Put hubcaps. Take out all the options, just a stripped down version. We don't need the different look and the different fascia and the special wheel. That doesn't, buyers of this car, they're not looking at that. They want a good value. And the value in these is how efficient they are, how well they work, and how reliable they are. Not about their options and the thrill of driving. And then that takes us to the second problem of the RAV4 Prime. Because it is currently priced at where it's priced at, it is extremely loud. I mean, it is something unbelievably loud for its price range. One thing I will say, they do ride better than the regular hybrids. And the reason for that is you have the giant battery underneath the car. It lowers the center of gravity, so they noticeably ride better. And the second thing about them is they are impeccable. They are as close to perfect in the build quality and kind of the fit and finish as they come. These are exclusively made in Japan and they're made in a very good factory. And the thing is just made well. You get into this and you get into a regular RAV4 hybrid that is made elsewhere, you're going to notice the difference. Not going to affect your reliability and whatnot, but just the fit and finish and how everything feels and how everything's put together, you feel a difference. But the problem is at that price point, it's way too loud. And what makes it even louder is the roof racks and the giant panoramic sunroof. It is extremely loud. And this is, has been always a complaint about the RAV4. Why can't we make it quieter? Just a little bit. I mean, we drove a CRV, it was so nice and quiet. Why can't this be the same? And this is a historic thing with the RAV4s. But then in the Prime, it becomes a much bigger problem because now you're paying a small fortune for this very fancy car, but it's very loud. And that's a serious problem with it, I think. And lastly, there is small, just this is my personal thing. It might not bother 90% of people that buy this car, but it really bothers me. I have to mention it here. You bought this for its quality, for its reliability and how well built it is, and it is all that. But then the part that makes this special over the regular RAV4 hybrid is the plug-in part. So when you go plug it in, you open that charge door, it is the flimsiest thing I've ever seen in my entire career working in the automotive industry. Why does this door have to be this massive and this flimsy? I don't understand. Doesn't affect your function. There's been no reports of it falling off or breaking otherwise yet. But we could have made it a little bit more solid feeling. I would have been nice, I think. Well, let's talk about some things you might not know about the RAV4 Prime and some important things that you should know. The first thing is, one of the hallmark features of the RAV4 Prime is one particular mode. So just to run through the modes real quick, you have three driving modes. You have EV, which is gonna drive you in electric range until it's depleted, then it switches into hybrid mode. That's the second mode where it's automatically gonna drive it like a hybrid switch the engine on, shut it off, we're not going to use the EV range completely. And then there's auto. Auto basically will take over the system and drive the most efficient as possible. If the temperature is good outside, we're going to drive an EV. When the EV depletes, we can automatically switch and it's kind of going to switch back and forth. If you all of a sudden floor it, you need more power, it's going to cancel out the EV automatically and then go back to it once you start driving normally. But there is a fourth mode, which is a hallmark charge mode. When the RAV4 Prime came out, the number one question I got asked is this. I live in an apartment. I have a RAV4 Prime or I want to buy a RAV4 Prime, but I will not be able to regularly charge it. Am I going to harm the battery by doing that? You actually will not. That's the first answer to that question. But then come charge mode. Charge mode is a mode where it forces the engine on to charge the battery exclusively. See, the engine is now gonna drive the car and charge the battery continuously up to 80%. So here is the scenario where this will actually work even if you have a charger at home. You commute to work every day. Your commute now is a little longer, it's 30 miles. And by the time you get to your destination and you get back on the way back, 
we're actually going to deplete our EV range and possibly you have other places you want to go after work. Well, on your way back from work, turn on charge mode. Yes, the engine will roar, gas mileage will not be as good as you are in, in hybrid mode, but you can actually charge up that battery and the surprise is, charges it up pretty quick. I mean, on a short 15, 20 mile drive, you can get it up pretty good, quarter of the way up. That is pretty impressive. And that is a mode that gives you another option. You normally drive this in, you know, commuting to work 50 miles, 50 miles back, you're well below the range of this car, so you never have to use the gasoline engine. Then you're going on a trip. You're gonna drive six hours to visit your in-laws, visit your parents, whatever the case may be. On your way there, you're obviously gonna deplete all your EV range, the last 40 miles of the trip, put it in charge mode. You charged it, you got to your destination. While you are in your destination, you have electric range already. You don't have to be worried, we're in a hotel, where do I charge? Or you're in your parents' house, hey, can I run this? And you can't use an extension cord to charge these, by the way. So you're not gonna cause this hassle. You can self-charge the car and not have to worry about it. That is one of the biggest features of this car. Let's talk about the RAV4 Prime outside and inside, and there's something important you should know. So the RAV4 Prime came out in 2021, then 2022, and then 2023, it actually got a facelift or kind of a major update. Not a lot have changed behind the scenes, but there's one important change we're gonna talk about. First thing is the headlights changed. Kind of the front fascia got a little tweak. It looks a little sharper, but so does the regular RAV4. And of course, the RAV4 Prime still has the light that everybody wants in their non-Prime model, only the XSE. Pretty cool looking. I mean, it's, it's not the uh, best looking car on the planet, but it's not the worst looking car on the planet. I think it actually looks pretty good and looks distinctive enough from the regular model. As we wrap around though, there is one interesting thing. The plug-in hybrid badge. So Toyota started getting rid of the hybrid badges on the fenders because they just felt like it was too much. Not the plug-in hybrid though. We still have the badging. And equally, we still have the black piano, piano black stuff on the side. I wish it was body color. It would actually look cooler. But again, this is a sport model with the black roof and the noise generators right here. Folks, if you own a RAV4 Prime or not, if you have one of these things, and you don't use it every single day, remove it because these make 90% of the noise of this car. It just takes that very loud noise, takes it to the next level. These make a lot of noise in these. Now, something with RAV4 Prime that is interesting. So you have, this has smart key, of course. This is an XSE premium package. You have, you can lock and unlock the doors from the front and the back. Usually that's reserved for like Lexus, but the RAV4 Prime does have that, which is pretty cool. At least for that high price, giving you something exquisite wheels to the RAV4 Prime. I mean, it's a nice design. If there was a hubcap there, nobody would complain. Going in the back, things relatively stayed very pretty similar in the back. Not much have changed. I like that they don't have extreme badging on this. RAV4 Prime and the other side is either SE or XSE. And that's it. We don't need another plug-in hybrid badge here and the whole jazz. We don't have that. Now, storage in the back is very, very similar to a regular RAV4. There's not really much about it. This particular one being an XSC Premium, it does have a JBL sound system, which is okay. JBL lately hasn't been the greatest with Toyota, but it works, it works decent. However, when you get the JBL, you do have a little bit more protrusion there. You have less space. Now, this is something I wish they would have changed, especially in the RAV4 Prime. They didn't even change it in the RAV4. You don't have an option to close this and lock it. I mean, we just did an update. That would have been nice to have, but they didn't, and that's okay. Now, we wrap around and talk about the charge port, which we talked about a little bit, but let's just reiterate, why does this have to be this big, and why does it have to be this flimsy? It's not the best door in the planet. It doesn't reflect the rest of the quality of this car, which is really good. Now, we do have a proper cover for this plug, 
we don't have like just wide open or seals around the edge. This is actually how the plug sh should be. Something happened in 2023, which is a major update. People really, I hope, are appreciating it because it was one of the, see the story, it doesn't. One of the biggest updates on the RAV4 Prime that people initially complained about, if you, in the years before 23, if you got the SE, you had a 3.3 kilowatt charger, onboard charger. Remember, we were limited by that onboard charger. In the XSE, you had a 6 or 6.6 .6 kilowatt charger. Well, now they both do have the same charger, so the higher capacity chargers, they both charge faster, which is really nice. Let's take a look on the inside because we also have some changes on the inside in 23 and up. The biggest change is to the infotainment system. So now the RAV4 Prime has Toyota's latest infotainment system. It's a, it's a huge upgrade. It does remain a little bit glitchy, but no complaints. We still like it. It works, and it works pretty good. Wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is really nice, kind of brought it to the 21st century. The screen in the higher trims of the Ferrari 4 is a 12.3 inch screen. It's a massive screen. I like that they did a few customizations. They were on the right road to make this screen actually usable and not just for show, but then they stopped because you can't really display the navigation properly on it and it just you can't display the whole map like why can't we just put the entire map on this then it will be actually useful to have a screen i am usually against screens so i'm not the person to ask but what i like about this update is even though they put this massive screen here and this got bigger things are new and improved they did not stray away from the important stuff physical controls they're extremely basic for the hvac system proper shifter all your hybrid controls are right here heat and cold seats right there very very basic and this is something that i love about the rav4 prime that is they have to be said here see usually the toyota loves to do this you get in their top trim and you'll see blank switches. It's like, but this is the top trim. Why is there black switches? I have a 2022 Camry Hybrid XSE with every single option. I have blank switches. It's like, what other option can I get to fill this blank switch? This is something about the RAV4 Prime that is not the case. You notice, usually on most RAV4s, this is a blank switch. There is no blank switches here. And equally, there is no blank switches here. So that is really nice at least if you're gonna buy the RAV4 Prime there's no blank switches which is nice now the seats always have been the case on the RAV4 Prime they're kind of a an interesting stitching on them with this line in the middle which I think is pretty cool not the most comfortable seats in the planet I have to admit that and the reason for that is this is a sport model because of course this is a sports car it's not folks I wish they would get away from this they are getting away from it from the newer model this seat is better but i think it would have the normal limited or xle seats it would have been even better making this even more comfortable some things about the rav4 interior this applies to all of them i really like how it's basic focused no nonsense no drama very easy to use and that is their hallmark and i think they this shows you do have a little storage area right there you do have decent storage everywhere wireless chargers right there but there's not a lot going on one thing is that is different here than the regular RAV4 you do have trail mode which is supposed to be for off-roading it works ish the charge mode though if you, you see here charge hold so you have to press and hold this button for the charge mode to come on i just wanted to make sure you see that works pretty good this actually does have windshield wiper warmers they're right here i'll show you how that works it's actually something very small but big and important if you live in cold climate so if you look right underneath the wiper you see this grid and it continues actually both wipers these are wiper warmers, so if you have ice build up, snow, whatnot, they'll actually warm them up and they'll thaw out. That is actually a pretty cool, useful feature. 
Overall, the RAV4 Prime does look, it looks distinct than the regular RAV4 hybrid, but the main thing that makes it do that, at least to me, I, I look at Toyotas all day long, all week long, is not really the looks. See, most people look at this car and they, they feel like, this, this just looks nicer than the regular RAV4. Why is that? Well, it's actually not the looks. It's the paint quality and the fit and finish of everything that makes it look just has a different feel, even on the inside. See, these are exclusively made in Japan. We've talked about this in a previous video. I'll leave that right here. Reliability-wise, they're both going to be the same because the engine and transmission and the design and everything is made the same. But the final fit and finish on the outside, it's always been the case. The Japanese models, they'll have better paint, better kind of small fit and finish the plastic will be better on the inside better feeling not that it's going to break on the other models but you feel this stuff and in this car you feel it a lot more because there hasn't been really much RAV4s that are made in Japan this is one of the exclusive ones that are made there and you see it you feel it and it's immediate and I guess that does help a little bit with the high price but still a base model would be nice Toyota and that is the RAV4 Prime folks this is a really good car for for those that buy it for the right reasons for those that don't mind this very high price and with this loud interior and the lack of a base model if you buy this for the right reasons which should be this works with your lifestyle that you have that short commute if you have 80 mile commute it kind of doesn't doesn't fit in if you want something that works electrically in town and then on that long trip just the engine comes on and off we go. And the most important thing why you should consider RAV4 Prime is reliability, built quality. These things are only made in Japan today. I don't know how that's going to go in the future. You definitely notice a huge difference when you get in one of these and a regular RAV4 made elsewhere. Not going to affect the reliability if you get one not made in Japan, but just the final fit to finish, the paint quality, the interior plastic, you can tell a difference and it's immediate. And the RAV4 Prime tends to drive a little better. This is not an exciting car in any way, shape or form, but it does feel more weighted because of the location of the battery. Simple science there. But the most important thing is, if you are that person that looks at electric cars and Yes, this sounds great, but I am not willing to make the lifestyle change yet. I feel like this is too much out of my comfort zone. I am too busy. I'm not really into cars. I don't want to make the pledge. But at the same time, I don't want to keep driving my old gas guzzler. This may actually fall as a perfect compromise between the two. You have some of the benefits of the electric cars, and then you have some of the benefits of the non-electric cars, the regular gasoline cars. This kind of sits in between, but you gotta make sure that you're buying it for the right reasons. And that number one reason should be reliability and build quality. This is not a thrilling car, even though some of the advertising materials will say that it is. It is not a thrilling car. It is a very good appliance, but you know what? Don't take that as a bad thing. Everyone needs an appliance. Not everyone needs a very thrilling high-end appliance that only works one day of the year. This is a car for the masses, folks. And the only criticism that I have against it is, for this price point, it could be a little quieter on the inside. And speaking of the price point, we need a base model very badly. We need a RAV4 Prime with hubcaps. So everyone in the masses can be able to actually afford one. Now that they are actually available, because when these first came out, they were extremely difficult to obtain. You had to wait for months, and it's not like they're available everywhere still, but they're better. They're getting better at it. Buy this for the right reasons, and you will not be disappointed in Toyota. Please make a base model for everyone else that wants to buy one, but can't afford it because it's way too expensive, and there's nothing sport about this. This is a sensible car that is well made. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my videos. Until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.